Hello, I'm Richard Herring. And I'm Abdul Crowley. And this is Sight on Screen. So, yes. this, this yeah, week. this week is a bit different. <laughs> This week it's a bit different. This week, uh, so last week we just wrapped up our best of uh, 2010s. Yeah, uh, we're decade uh, long uh, list. The best and worst of. Let's not remember the plot twist. Yeah, no, we we had carrot and stick, and I think we both got a healthy dose of both. Yeah, and uh, also we're also doing this uh, remote, uh, so bear with us if there's some technical difficulties because you know applying with. Uh, Social distancing standards, so... Yeah, we're probably a little bit late to get on that train, but we decided it was probably wise at this point. <laughs> yeah, probably. And, uh, yeah, so this this week, it was my turn to choose a movie, and mm. we have uh, just finished the once-in-a-century month-long 420 celebration. Yes. And I thought, what better way to celebrate the stoner holidays <laughs> than to watch a stoner <laughs> movie? And a lot, of pop, a lot of movies popped in my head, uh, most of which we've probably both seen, like uh, Big Lebowski, oh, yeah. Friday, Half-Baked, etc. Mm. Uh, oh, and uh, Silent J. No, J and Silent Bob, sorry. J and Silent Bob, yeah. Clerks, yeah. gotta love those guys. But I mean, yeah. you also mentioned this on the in your best of. So this was already something that we'd covered. I mean, you mentioned this with firm praise, and I hadn't seen it. So it seemed like a good opportunity. Yeah, and the movie we're talking about is Inherent Vice yes. by Paul Thomas Anderson. With Joaquin Phoenix. Uh, Joaquin Phoenix Joaquin Phoenix in the starring role, uh, coupled with uh, Josh Brolin, let's not forget him, and uh, Joanna Newsom. You have uh, Reese Witherspoon, if I remember correctly. Uh, even an appearance by Eric Roberts, who is one of my favorites. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this, the, the, the cast on this thing is crazy deep. Yeah, I and mean, everyone gets like a five-minute uh, section. Basically. Everybody gets a little bit of something. I mean, for me, it's always kind of weird to see Eric Roberts, Roberts show up in anything. Because mm -hmm. he, he's one of those guys who just doesn't pop up that very much. Same thing when I had when Benicio Del Toro shows up. Same thing I had when Owen Wilson showed up. I mean, like, wait, you're here, and you're here, and you're here. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, the whole movie is like that, which is kind of crazy. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, no, so, so yeah, we chose this. This is a, a stoner movie, as I mentioned, but it's it's one that's very different from others in that, yes, the plot is convoluted, as is uh, the nature of these kinds of movies, uh, Big Lebowski being a big one of those, but this one is very character driven. Yeah, but I mean, I here's the say. thing: this is this is convoluted, but it's not convoluted in the way of like Lebowski because it's not really that meandering. It's more of a th this is like Chinatown mixed with Boogie Nights. Yes, that's a really good uh, comparison there with Chinatown. I completely agree. Yes, this is very much like Chinatown because this is a. This is set in the 70s. Actually, it's set in 1970, to be exact. And yeah, no, it's, it's a very much that detective that story. Time. No, no, yeah, but it's actually, they actually say it. It's set in 1970, specifically. And yeah. uh, it's a noir story with a private eye who, uh, Joaquin Phoenix plays a private detective. Mm. And it's also a stoner movie. So it's a very weird mix of genres. <laughs> Yeah, because, I mean, the the basic plot, and I don't think we're going to be able to really get too heavily into what the plot is, because that's a little bit like trying to solve a Rubik's Cube while blindfolded in the dark and on cocaine. Good yeah. luck. I mean, it is so over-the-top China. It's even further than Chinatown. Chinatown, you can follow. This thing here is all over the map. Yeah, it no, no, it it back it, and forth. No, it holds nothing back. It just throws everything at you, and you have to really pay attention to those names because yeah, they keep I mean, throwing names at you back, <laughs> back and forth. And if you're not paying attention, you'll miss out completely what's going on. Yeah, no, because it's kind of like you you start off with what seems to be a fairly simple crime setup. You know, the very typical noir. The girl comes back into the main detective's life. 
Mm-hmm. However, it's the first time I've seen that where the guy is so clearly stoned, you don't know if this is a hallucination or real. They actually mention that in the opening scene. She she tells him, oh, he's trying to figure out if I'm a hallucination. And he goes, no, yeah. no, just different packaging is all. <laughs> yeah, no, he even has like a moment later where he's interviewing somebody and he underlines not hallucinating. Yeah. <laughs> Everything yeah, is so, under question so, here. He's so used to being uh, stoned all the time and hallucinating. So yeah, this is a this is a story from very much in the same vein of I would say Joker from 2019, where mm. you get also starring Joaquin Phoenix, where you get the story through the character's eyes, and you only pretty much see what the character sees, yeah, and get get the information that the character gets. So and, and coupled with that, you have an unreliable narrator narrator with a voice in his head that's also in question whether they're real or not or may have been real at some point or not yeah because there's 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 a narrator who is a sort of liege yeah because it's like it's his friend so she does show up in the film but why she's narrating is never like explained why is she the one doing that yeah but remember she's the only he's the only one that's communicating with her at any given moment uh no there is a well that depends because there is a flashback where his girlfriend is also communicating with her but we don't know if that's an actual thing that happened or if it's just in his head yeah yeah the one with the with the ouija board ouija board yeah yeah so it's a very uh, so like, like i was saying it's a very unreliable narrator you don't know what the hell's going on at any given moment anything can be real anything can be hallucination but at the end of the day or at least in my opinion, it's hmm. not really the point of the movie no. so much. The plot is there to sort of put the characters in these wacky situations, and then it's how they react to the situation that makes the movie. Yeah, I mean, you are you are meant to follow the plot, kind of, but I think it is purposefully designed to lose you. Mm-hmm. I mean, th- this thing is running at a thousand miles an hour, and you're expected to keep up on foot. I mean, it, it knows it's going to lose you. Yeah, I think it's, try- it's trying very hard to put you in the same mentality as our uh, our protagonist, Doc Sportello. Yeah, Joaquin Phoenix, and I have to say, he is. I I'm a I have kind of the mixed bag when it comes to his performances. I think all of them are amazing. My question is usually, how likable are they? How in much do I enjoy them? Mm-hmm. This is one of his ones I enjoyed the most. I got yeah. a real kick out of this. This is a it this is a this is a Joaquin Phoenix that it didn't feel like a prestige performance. This felt like just straight up acting and it felt like he was having fun, which is important. Yeah, I think I think that's that's a very good point to bring up because I felt like all the actors kind of were having fun. Josh Brolin especially, oh, who was man, really Brolin. yeah, who was really hamming it up in that role, <laughs> who was enjoying himself like crazy. And that's yeah, uh, that's, I mean, that's he a, is a really fun this thing the- to see fork and spoon he is just chowing down on that scenery like it is nobody's business yeah and it's really nice I mean, to see like a movie where where everyone is sort of enjoying themselves because it's supposed to be it's it's a bit lighthearted with a lot of serious undertones so it's nice hmm. to see that everyone is having a good time oh yeah no, i mean this it doesn't shy away from dark territory really but it handles everything lightly and every character is kind of their own brand of eccentric drug fueled madness, mm-hmm. which kind of makes everything a lot easier to swallow. Yeah, everyone I mean, has their own quirks <laughs> all the way. Through. Yeah, I mean, let's let, let's be clear. I mean, there, uh, there's a couple of moments in the performances here that are just so bizarre. But how many times do you get to see a clearly muscle bound neo Nazi in a purple fishnet top? <laughs> Yes. I mean, really, it's like that's. <laughs> yeah, it's like, wait, what? He's wearing a flower necklace. I am confused. <laughs> yeah, and it's the same necklace that he was commenting on uh, from before. So, yeah, it's, it's really, it's the whole movie is it's such a, an amazing romp uh, with yeah. an incredible eye for detail. And, you know, you were mentioning Joaquin's performance. I love it so much. I completely agree with you. It is one of his, one of my favorite performances of his. Uh, maybe second only to another uh, Paul Thomas Anderson movie called The Master. He is which, really uh, good in The Master. I mean, the yeah. only film, uh, the, the only film I think I can point to and think he's done a better job in performance is You Were Never Really Here, mainly because yeah, I think that thing is a tour de force. 
mm-hmm. but that movie is just plain old hard to watch. This is a very enjoyable Joaquin. I mean, he's mm, kind of found this wonderful like line between likable and yet kind of unlikable. Yeah, right. Yeah, and it's and it's so it's so funny. I love all the little faces he makes every now and then, and the like. Every time he looks up and he does a little like twitch with his lip, and then the little twitch with the eyebrows, and his eyes kind of drift back and forth. It's so it's such a lovely performance, especially considering like the the camera always zooms really close into his face. Uh, oh yeah, no, they may. Yeah, I mean, this is the most his like uh, lip scar has ever been on display. <laughs> good, yeah, good point. <laughs> But I mean, uh, here's the thing. Doc, Doc Sportello is the kind of guy I would love to have a drink with. I would never want him in my house. No, no, not at all. Especially seeing what, what a pig style he lives. <laughs> oh, God, that's terrible, isn't it? And it's questionable whether he showers or not. And it's kind of up in the air. <laughs> yeah, whether he, he, he... His feet are... I, he, they keep talking about him cleaning his feet. I, I never saw it happen. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, so yeah, no, the the whole uh, the whole uh, little nice like intricacies in his performances were were amazing. One of my favorite scenes in the movie is when um, uh, Hope, I believe her name is, uh, mm. yeah, who plays Owen Wilson's uh, J- yeah Jade. No, no is, it, is it Jade or is it Hope? I'm pretty no, sure no, no, no. Jade is the girl he meets at the. Um, I, I don't even know what to call this place. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the what was it, pussy eaters? <laughs> yeah, that's the one. That's the one. Yeah, no, it was uh, <laughs> just. Uh, did you see the sign in the background mm-hmm. listing the prices? Oh, oh yeah, God. <laughs> just what? <laughs> that whole scene was what <laughs> with the pink yeah, furry yeah. wall and all that stuff. Just oh, everything. <laughs> you just yeah. really left wondering. Wait, what happened here? <laughs> who who designed this set? I think you're talking about, uh, is it uh, Maya Rudolph as Petunia Leeway? Is that right? Uh, she plays, uh, what's his name? Owen Wilson's uh, wife. Oh, yeah, no, no, Jenna Malone. Jenna Malone as Hope Yeah, Carlton. yeah, she's Hope. Yeah, yeah. Hope. Yeah, yeah. And, and when she gives him the picture of her oh, baby. Oh, God, yes. And I he don't just picks it up and screams. <laughs> But like, the best part like is a, he, a quick second, and then he, he goes back he, to normal. Like, oh he, yeah, he yeah. has this wonderful. It, it's like a cartoon bit. It's like something you'd imagine, like Daffy Duck do. It's just like ah, and then back. Yeah, and, and completely it, normal. he returns to <laughs> such normal, and you're just like, oh my god, what? I, I had to stop the movie. I I, I couldn't stop laughing. <laughs> Yeah, it's, and it's like these wonderful scenes thrown in there. That and like the Martin Short, the whole bit with Martin oh. Short. That Ladies and gentlemen, bit, when but... Martin Short showed up, I'm thinking to myself, okay, movie, what do you want to do here? And then it really began going nuts, and I'm like, oh, wow. It does not disappoint. <laughs> this is the most fun I've seen Martin Short have on film in years. Mm-hmm. He is... It... He, he... Oh, man. No, I mean, he, he goes completely crazy, and it's the, the best The best part is is sort of, that's when you start seeing the Paul Thomas Anderson influences in, in the movie, because this is... A... Yeah. Because I I don't think we mentioned this earlier, but uh, this is based off of a book. Uh, the story in Heron Vice based off of the book of the same name by author Thomas uh, Pynchon. Yeah, Pynchon, I believe it's pronounced. But yeah, um, however yeah, you Thomas it. Pynchon. <laughs> yes, and uh, if you think the story here is nonsensical, then uh, yeah, I've heard that the book is. A bajillion times worse. Oh my! Really? I would have yeah. thought this was more. I mean, but going back to the thing you were saying about Paul Thomas Anderson, Paul Thomas Anderson's s- style is usually quite recognizable, mm-hmm. especially in when he's doing quieter movies, something like Phantom Thread. Oh, Here yeah. it's Phantom more Thread. like Boogie Nights territory. That it's very kind of like it's so much going on those little details are kind of lost but it's an overarching style but you're right mm-hmm. the second we meet short it's kind of like oh wait oh here we go yeah this is mm-hmm. this is more what we're looking for this is style over substance sometimes yeah and then and source of that that escalating tension that keeps going as they're uh, driving in the car and the police pulls oh, yeah. them over and it's that it's that <laughs> really like nice interplay between the characters as they're all losing their minds simultaneously <laughs> yeah i mean this movie has this wonderful balance between style substance and substance abuse it is just really trying to find that <laughs> middle space because it is so 
it, it is almost like um, what's the movie? The one with um, Johnny Depp. Del Toro's in it as well. Um, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Yeah, it has a very kind of similar genetic strand mm-hmm. to it because yes. it does feel like you are watching something while on a hallucinogenic almost. Completely agree. It's uh, uh, yeah, and Fear and Loathing is actually a really good analog to at least the parts of this movie that are sort of stoner based because like we mentioned this is sort of an amalgamation of different genres and it try it does a really interesting balancing act between them and one of the and yeah that's one of the parts of the movie is basically uh, this is a stoner movie so they have to have these sort of insane moments and you yeah. see it through the eyes of these these uh, crazy hippies basically <laughs> but one thing i will say number one is something we probably should have got out of the way front i mean this is one we both recommend right i oh, certainly yeah. do. no this is i mean it was on my one of my favorite it's one of my yeah, favorite exactly so from, i mean uh, 20 uh, what was it 2017 yeah watch this movie no 2014 14, 14, yeah, 14 yeah, earlier yeah. i mean watch this movie if you're listening to this stop what you're doing and watch this movie and then come back because this deserves to be witnessed <laughs> yeah you kind of well, want to be actually, surprised by a lot of this well, actually, I've always had trouble recommending this movie because even really? though I love this movie, it is it is a tough one to swallow for. I think it's a tough one to swallow for a lot of people, and I think that was also reflected in its critical reception. So a lot of people really, really loved the movie, and then a lot of people really hated it because they couldn't quite follow what was going on. I mean, I get that, but I think it is, as you said, a question of like how much is the story the point? Because if you're willing to just kind of take a leap of faith and let this mood that this film is kind of overtake you. You're good. You're fine. You don't need to worry about if you can follow the intricacies of this completely Byzantine plot. (laughs) Yeah. And I mean, that's, that's how I, when I first saw it, that's, that's what I did. So I had read Hmm. about the controversies about it and went in just sort of like, you know what, I'm ready to go, go in for the ride and just take me there. You know what I mean? And Mm -hmm. uh, it's only until I saw it the second and third time that I really tried to sort of understand the underlying themes and and what it's actually trying to say in the story. Yeah, I mean, I tuned uh, into that stuff pretty quick because I've watched a lot of, like, old noir. That's very much my genre. So the second they kind of started talking about real estate and competing groups and all the rest of it, my brain just kind of clicked on those circuits and went, okay, here's what we need to be looking for. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, so no, and I love like 1940s and 50s noir as well. Yeah, uh, exactly. You know, Humphrey Bogart, let's not forget. Oh, yeah, I mean, the big sleep is all over this thing. Oh my god, big sleep, amazing. Yeah. But I mean, the, the one thing I will say, though, is that any movie, any movie ever that has the audacity and the strength to open with Josh Brolin in an afro <laughs> has my heart. Yes. Oh, yeah. I really want to talk about this. Let's I talk swear about to... the yeah. Afro scene. Because this, this starts the movie pretty much. We have we have the introduction of the case. We have the girlfriend comes back, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And that's just set up. Chasta. Yeah, that's just set up. Our first introduction into what kind of movie we're really dealing with is a TV commercial for a real estate development that has Josh Brolin wearing what I can only assume he stole something from, you know, um, uh, what is the name of that character from Starchy and Hutch? Um, yes. Uh, mm, Huggy Bear? Huggy Bear, yeah. It, he looks like he beat up Huggy Bear at a back alley and stole his look. But it's Josh Brolin with this big afro and these awesome 70s glasses and this absolute mother-loving collar. And you're like, what? Is this movie? <laughs> and then he, and then it zooms in on him, and he goes, "This can only be described in two words: right on, <laughs> right on." And it's so clearly he's not this kind of guy. It sounds so awkward. Yeah, and that's and that's sort of the whole point is that you you kind of have these two really conflicting characters, and that you're right. That's that's the first time we see Josh Brolin, and. He plays it so well as an actor because you're able to immediately tell that this is not the character's comfort zone. 
No, not the actor, completely. but the character's comfort zone. And they're sort of putting on a show. And, you know, the background of, of it all is this real estate deal, like you were saying. And it's clearly a really shitty real estate <laughs> deal. Oh, yeah. No, this is like, oh, you, you get the view of this of this runoff, basically. <laughs> and it's like, oh, it's so anyone good. Anyone who's lived in Los Angeles knows what these things are. You have seen these places. I have been through LA. I know what this looks like. And these are infamous. These are exactly the kind of real estate deals they made back then. Mm -hmm. But the thing I really adore is you're, you're looking at this character and you're thinking to yourself, this can't be the character. Now, if Joaquin Phoenix at this point had looked up and went, Johnson, I would have bought that. But he calls him, as it does everyone else in this movie, Bigfoot. Yep. His name is is uh what is it? Christian Bigfoot uh Bjornson. Bjornson. Yeah. And you're like, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> what? <laughs> Even in the police report at one point, he's referenced as Christian F. Bigfoot Bjornson. <laughs> Bjornson, exactly. Lieutenant Detective. And you're like, I'm sorry. That can't be this man's name. <laughs> yeah, and so and 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 the thing that one of the things that I really love about this movie, and this is we're we're bringing up Josh Brolin and and how to how the sort of he contrasts uh, Joaquin Phoenix's character is. Oh yeah. The two of the big themes, at least that I see, or there are really three big themes, but two of them that I see at least is one is the the sort of the influx of this extreme capitalism that started happening in the seventies. And it was mm -hmm. the end of the 60s and the hippie era and where everything was, and even in this movie, it's all so glorified and you know everything was so good back in the 60s. And then the Manson uh, murders happened. Yeah, which the Manson murder brought up a lot. Yeah, and that was sort of... Like... <laughs> yeah, go for it. Yeah, and that, that was that's sort of the, the point where a lot of people, even in reality, see it as the end of the 60s was mm -hmm. that event. And then you go into the 70s and you have this sort of crony capitalism started to happen and you start having these crazy, you know, real estate moguls and, and these casinos pop up everywhere and all that stuff. And and so you have that sort of that theme in the background. Then you also have the theme of these characters that are out of time and out of place, which are both Brolin's character and Phoenix's character. Oh, Phoenix yeah. is sort of the the hippie of the '60s, and Brolin is that uh, straight. Uh, what do you call it? Like uh, straight like man. Straight, yeah, straight man of the '60s, which was you know the hard worker that the com the complete opposite of the of the hippie essentially. And both of them were around in the '60s, but in the '70s, at, as things started to sort of more be more uniform and more conjoined. Both of these characters seem completely out of place in, in the time and in the movie as well. Yeah, but it's also the fact that those are completely subverted because, yeah, you have the hippie stoner and you have, you know, the, the straight man. But there's, there's two counterpoints there. I mean, this is the thing. It's like the challenge against those stereotypes is also very present because on one side you have Phoenix, who despite all of the demeanor and all of the kind of glazed attitude he's bringing to this, at no point acts unintelligently. He's making oh, yeah, no, smart no, moves. He's Yeah, he's handling things well. And then my personal favorite little thing that this movie decides to do for reasons I will never understand <laughs> is you take the traditional male 60s hardworking icon that is Brolin. And for some reason, you have him on several occasions in this movie going to absolute town on a chocolate banana. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> he is treating this thing like he wants to marry it. It, it, it is. Uh, there's even a scene in the car where you have it in real foreground and all you're watching is Phoenix looking in his side vision at what is happening. And you're seeing Roland so just confused. choking on this thing. And you're like, what? Is this because it's so obvious? Like this isn't a hint. Something is being told to me here, and I desperately try to figure out what it is. That's all this pent up masculinity. <laughs> yeah, like what are <laughs> you doing? You you are not eating this thing. I know you're not. I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's like he has diabetes. And there is no more insulin left but in that banana. And he's trying desperately to get it out. <laughs> he, he is treating this thing like he owes it money. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> I am telling you, this thing is made Marion to him. It's nuts. It's like, what are you doing? Absolutely no wonderful. One. Yeah, he's he's made Marion and it's little John. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> yes, very much so. <laughs> But boy, oh boy. But I mean, there's also so many, but the, the weirdest part of the Brolin character is when we have like the one little insight into his home life, or we have mm. two instances, his child pouring him alcohol. Yes. And the, a, utterly ab- <laughs> and the abuse he suffers at his wife. And you're like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah. And she, and she like goes to town on Phoenix. He's like, you, you, do you know what kind of, uh, uh, psychiatrist bills that we need to pay because of you. <laughs> yeah, but it's also the fact that she is not seen. She looks like she's the she's uh, the uh, house owner in Tom and Jerry. She's just framed oh, yeah. from the legs up. I mean, from yeah, the yeah. legs up. Uh, I mean, yeah, you only you you, you never see above uh, the neckline essentially. Yeah, and you're like, what? But that happens a lot in this movie. Yeah, there's a lot of very odd framing. And that's actually one of the things that I really, really like when it, if we're talking from a directorial and, and sort of cinematography standpoint is mm. a lot of the framing in this movie is very focused on the characters oh, yeah. that you're supposed to focus on. So when even when Phoenix is talking to another character, sometimes it just lingers on Phoenix's face and we don't see the other character as they're walking around, as they're talking to him. It just lingers on his face to see his reaction as they're as they're conversing and and in addition to that you have a lot of these really long one takes throughout the movie uh most yeah, notably like takes, the scene as he's walking camera. excuse me there are a lot of one takes with fixed camera which is something that's a lot more indicative of it's imitating kind of that 60s film style yeah, but there's also a lot of dolly shots that really slowly move in to the characters, no, even right. as they're talking. When, which one was the one you were going to mention? Yes, yeah, so I was the I was thinking about the one where uh, it's in the beginning uh, when he first uh, when, when Shasta sort of presents the case to him as his ex girlfriend, mm. and she tells him, you know, walk me to my car, and it's a really long, like almost five whole minute scene of him walking her to her car. Yeah, you're uh, right. Saying goodbye, and then walking away, meeting his friend, and deciding to go to grab a pizza, essentially. And it's this really long one shot that's like almost entirely from from uh, Joaquin's back the whole point and <laughs> the whole time. Yeah, and you're just right. follows that him I, around. It's interesting because it is kind of understated. They're not very showy one takes. Yeah, no, no, not at all. But but and and it's also another one that I really liked is when him and Reese Witherspoon's character sit on the park bench and it's not even oh yeah and it's just a a really really like excruciatingly slow uh mm. dolly shot of them uh, as it slowly sort of zooms into them uh while they're just talking and they're just talking yeah. and it's so nice I, I mean it's such a nice framing and they just get to act essentially yeah i mean the one that i noticed for that is and full credit to katherine waterston who is playing shasta faye hepworth she's the mm. girlfriend who comes back into his life because later in the film, she has yes. a harrowing monologue. Oh my it's god, a, yes. It's 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 a really intense kind of you know exposure of this character. And it's all in a single static frame. Mm-hmm. And she just runs with it. It's no cutting, there's no editing. It's all on her to really carry that scene. Because Joaquin is just he's there, but he is very purposefully not really in central shot. He is not really being shown to have a reaction to all this it's all on no her. he's not even in focus it's it's all focused on her and she carries it like an absolute champ i mean good grief is it a it is a serious piece of acting in this movie and there's a lot of really good performances oh yeah no the the whole movie i mean from start to finish there's not a single performance that is lacking everyone mm-hmm. is bringing beyond their a game yeah, and even yeah, the B and characters the, the, even the B characters, yeah. Like I love the the little, um, uh, what do you call her? The the secretary sort of that sits outside of his office inside of a doctor's. Oh yeah, yeah. He had like a, yeah. he has a he has an office in the maternity ward. I don't know what this place is. Something like that. I don't know. I think <laughs> it might be a gynecologist's office. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think it's a gynecologist's office. And he passes by the actual 
doctor goes doctor, and then the doctor replies, yeah, doctor. <laughs> they know each other as doctor. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, uh, it's so I mean, my favorite one for that is the FBI agents. Oh, yeah. I don't know uh, where they got these guys, but I think Twin Peaks. Yes, very much so. They have a, yeah, they have a really odd little, like, kind of, you know, their own, they're, they're very much in their own little world. They're doing their own thing. They're not really part of this movie, and they don't act like they're part of this movie. No, not at all. And it's like, usually we're the ones asking questions, sir. <laughs> and then they, he just keeps going, and they're it. like, well, yeah. <laughs> Crazy. Uh, no, I mean, it is one of those movies where every little... There, there isn't, like, one central thing that I can point at and say, this is why this movie is good. It is a combination of all these little pieces. It's yeah, all these no. little things that kind of build together into this very odd tapestry. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, circling back a little bit on the scene where you, that you were talking about with the girlfriend, that's, that's the scene for me that, that's that sort of embodies in in its entirety actually the third theme for me that i that i would that i noticed mm. so you had the theme of uh, sorry these char these characters that are out of time and out of place yep. and you have the theme of this uh, of uh hippies versus capitalism of the 70s mm -hmm. yep and the third theme i feel is is sort of almost i would say grieving but also uh, like the grieving process, but also this in this craving and missing someone. You know what I mean? Yeah, no. There's a lot of a lot of the characters here are missing somebody. You're right. I think that's actually kind of a common thread between all the major players here. Yeah. And and in a lot of ways, I think, as, and bringing it back to hope. So in a lot of ways, when when we lose someone, you know, we we go through the stages of grief, obviously, mm. and. One of which is denial, and we don't want to. We think like, oh, oh, there's something wrong. This is pro our, you know, the, our loved one is not dead. They probably mix something up. This is not, this is not real, etc. And she goes through that same process, but then it turns out that she's right, essentially. Yeah, but in the same, <laughs> which is weird. Yeah, but in the same way that you have uh, uh, Bigfoot, uh, Brolin's character who has lost his partner. Mm -hmm. He is the angriest human being alive through this entire film, which is another stage of great. Yeah, anger. exactly. He is so angry. Just he is chomping at. The, he is literally at one point chomping at the bit. Almost, it's just he is just boiling with rage. This entire film. Yeah, and so I think like the the culmination of this theme of of uh, sort of grieving essentially mm. is really put to rest and sort of reaches the point of, of acceptance in that scene of her monologuing at the end of it uh, after they after it's she completely you know lets uh, pretty much pours her heart out essentially yeah. and sort of they come to an understanding that uh, that yeah it's okay that she's gone it's okay that you're missing this person it's okay to move on and that's further emphasized in sort of liege when she sort of reiterates that point later on. Yeah, and I guess in, if we're going to follow that theme, I would almost put Eric Roberts as kind of the MacGuffin of the movie, uh, Michael Wolfman. He's kind yeah, of the what, central... What a name. What, what a name. name. Can Michael we, can we please appreciate, Wolfman. <laughs> can we please appreciate Mickey Wolfman. <laughs> Mickey Wolfman as played by Eric Roberts. You couldn't choose better. I, I mean, really. <laughs> but he is, uh, I, I guess, it. if we're going to follow this theme, he's going to be uh, negotiating. He yeah, is the one, yeah. he's kind of negotiating with his own conscience. He's giving away his money, suddenly he is, suddenly he's not. There's a lot of back and forth and people trying to handle him because he's negotiating with this guilt he's carrying for all the stuff he's done. Can we also just mention the fact that it is utterly bizarre and not really detailed in the film why a man who is apparently Jewish is heavily associated with the Aryan Brotherhood? Yes, <laughs> that's that's actually one of the first things that we find out about Eric Roberts' character. You know, because because the whole case that that uh, Joaquin Phoenix gets, I, I gotta yeah. sort of reiterate because we we keep going back and forth. But the whole case is essentially uh, his girlfriend says that his wife and her boyfriend, uh, Wolfman's wife and Wolfman's uh, and boy and Wolfman Wolfman's wife and yes, her and, boyfriend. And the, yeah, the wife's boyfriend mm. wanna 
put Wolfman in a loony bin for money reasons, essentially. Because and yes. we find out later that it's because he's sort of giving it away, essentially, and they want to stop him from doing that. Uh, and so his uh, so Joaquin's ex girlfriend Shasta drops by, gives him this case, tells him, you know, help me figure this out, and she also goes missing. Yeah, because uh, Wolfman is her for... sugar daddy, pretty much. Yeah, uh, whom she loves apparently. It's at one point they mention, uh, yeah, but, but yeah. Okay. A whole other bag of <laughs> a whole other thing of how how she loves him, and then at the same time, the relationship that they had. We can get into yeah. that later, <laughs> but, it, but yeah, it's, it's so yeah. Much. So she gives him this case. She goes missing as well, and he, he's sort of put the task to look for both Wolfman and his uh, ex Shasta. Mm. Shasta, yeah, that's how you pronounce it. Yeah, uh, and yeah, and. He comes across this almost cult-like, I would say, uh, and it has, like you were saying, uh, the really big, almost built like a brick wall guy with a swastika on his face, yeah. but also in. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to find in this guy's fish. name. <laughs> yeah, because that guy there has presence all of his own. That is Christopher <laughs> Allen Nelson, apparently. No, what a that's wonderful not role that... he had. I mean, that was wow. amazing. <laughs> yeah, no, and it's it... such a tiny role too. It's, it's incredible. I mean, everybody in this thing is just really bringing a really weird energy, but I like it. I mean, and this is also, I will say, one of the few films I've really enjoyed Owen Wilson in because I usually can't stand him, and I completely agree. He showed up and like they showed a photo of him first. And like, no, please, yeah, no, right. don't do this. <laughs> don't bring this man in. No. But he I was had fine. A very, he was good. He was actually really good. Yeah, it was surprising. It, everyone here did an amazing job, and and I had the same reaction to Owen Wilson in uh, uh, Life Aquatic with. Uh, oh Steve yeah, Susan. yeah, yeah, yeah. With <laughs> Bill Murray, uh, mm. you know, referencing our uh, the dead don't die. Dead don't, dead don't die. die. <laughs> the dead don't die. Man, I want to just rewatch that again now because it's so right. good. I've watched it like two times in the last three weeks, and I still want to watch it more. <laughs> That's an amazing movie. <laughs> but tangent aside. <laughs> tangent aside. Tangent aside. Tangent aside. Uh, so oh, yeah, man. Yeah, so we find we find Eric Roberts and and this like cult like uh, uh, mental institution, which is yep. also a rehab facility uh, apparently. Uh, well, I mean, we we keep bouncing uh, around because and... there's so many little middle points between this, where he goes to he goes to a club, then he goes to an office, then he go. You know, it's hard to actually keep it straight in your head what is happening because every other scene, Joaquin has got a different haircut and is pretending to be a different personality, yeah. but is still clearly stoned, <laughs> and he's trying to pretend to be all these people, and it never works. No, it never works. I and mean, he does an amazing job of trying of playing this sort of person who's desperately trying to keep his cover, but at the same time bumbling around. Yeah, the only time it truly works is when he's at this mental facility you mentioned under the care of Dr. Threepling and Dr. Lily Hammer. Lily Hammer, yeah. I, I, yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> the names in this are just uh, unbelievable. My personal favorite for names, though, has to be Benicio Del Toro's character, Sancho Smilax Esquire. Yeah, like if if you had any doubt that this was a uh, a lawyer of a Latin descent, Sancho and Esquire, <laughs> like that's, that's such a... just knocking it out of the park every time. Marine, Marine law, <laughs> we Marine <find> law. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna kick him. You can't kick my 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 client. That's assault. <laughs> yeah, he's like. I think he meant, you know, that that's, You're let me go. That, that's, police, that's police slang. I think they just mean letting me go. <laughs> You're just, you, you are always caught off guard by this movie because it, that's the one thing I will completely give it credit. It is never going where I think it's going. Every time I think I have a track on this, they go completely out of left field because we start off with what I think is a real estate deal. Yeah. And then we start seeing elements of something called the Golden Fang. Yeah, so so, just to sort of summarize the the case in its mm. entirety. So you start with this real estate mogul who 
has that new project that they're trying to sell to people, which is the shitty, uh, really, uh, like you were saying, very typical California. Yeah, it's what Bigfoot's selling with an afro. Yeah, that's what Bigfoot is is selling with an afro. Right on. Right on. (laughs) (laughs) And and at the same time, he you know he's he's sort of influenced by Joaquin Phoenix's ex, who Mm. they're dating at that point, Shasta. uh, Even though he's married and his wife has a boyfriend, it's a whole thing. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, there's a whole lot of ties that indicate what this relationship are. Yeah, and so he's influenced by her, and he realizes that he's made a mistake. And you were, you were talking about the bargaining aspect of it. He's going through bargaining where he realizes that he's been selling people shelter, but at, he, he even quotes this. He's been selling people shelter, never realizing that this should be free. Yes. And so he goes off to this crazy place where he's sort of giving away money to people and, and hippies, essentially, the leftover hippies. At least we believe so. It's never actually shown. Yeah. It is merely spoken about yeah it, it's mentioned that that might be what he's going and so his wife and his wife's boyfriend uh put him in an institution that institution mm-hmm. is run by uh people a crime syndicate essentially yes who has three facets to their organization <laughs> yeah. one is the smuggling of heroin using mm-hmm. the golden fang as a schooner boat yes uh, in and out of the of the port, it's also a syndicate of dentists who, bringing it back to the whole capitalism thing, started the syndicate to avoid uh, paying taxes. Essentially, yeah, and also called Golden Fang Enterprises. Uh, very funny, Fang and dentist. Yeah. <laughs> and these dentists, basically, uh, what they do is so people go to heroin. Hope mentions that if you stay on heroin long enough, it eats up your calcium, so your teeth it rot. It sucks the calcium from your body. Yeah, so your teeth rot. So they go to the dentist, the dentist fix them with new teeth, and the other aspect of the syndicate is the rehab facility at slash mental facility, which is where yes. Robert sits. A uh, mental facility which apparently is called also Golden Fang, but in Greek. Yes, exactly. In they Greek. are very on brand, these people. Yeah, and so they they get them they get them hooked on the product. They fix they fix them up, and then they put them through rehab, and they sort of capitalize on the whole process essentially, which is a very yeah. sophisticated crime syndicate. I mean, well done. I mean, talk about brand management. Can we just talk about just for a second how utterly bizarre this mental facility is? Oh, because yeah. it is weird, isn't it? There, there's a lot of praying in like hooded robes and there's a repeat there's only like anti-commie films on repeat yeah <laughs> yeah yeah and it's actually even mentioned at one point that the that the actor in these anti-commie films used to be a commie <laughs> essentially he used to be a commie but then he disappeared on the golden fang sco- on exactly on the golden fang schooner disappeared for a couple of years came back and all of a sudden he's got a change of heart and a change of politics <laughs> Yeah, and you're just kind of sitting there going like, wait, what does this have to do with anything? Because there's a big scene between Phoenix and Del Toro talking about it, but it's not relevant. Until you reach the the facility and you see that they're playing his movies, so it's all connected into this this sort of uh, conspiratorial, conspiratorial uh, Illuminati-esque, uh, like, yeah. uh, what do you call it, like, drug smuggling yeah. operation. <laughs> I don't know, but I mean, this is the thing that kind of, this is why the movie is so hard to follow is because everything is connected, but not every connection is actually relevant to anything that's happening plot wise. Yeah, and that's actually very much in line of what a detective would go through. Yeah, no, so, it is. It's actually yeah, a very you, good reflection of old noir. Yeah, because a detective goes through and investigates a crime, and everything is obviously related to the crime, but not everything is relevant to the crime. And, you know, you brought up Chinatown. Chinatown is a great example of how oh, yeah. that sort of plays into the to the plot and how not everything actually relates to the plot. And you find out in the end that actually everything that the person investigated had almost nothing to do <laughs> with, yeah, I mean, with what I mean, actually happened. This movie is pretty much what if Chinatown was being starred by the big Lebowski? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that is exactly the best way to explain this. Chinatown has portrayed through the eyes of the big Lebowski. Yeah, what if you had this completely out of his mind on grass character trying to navigate this incredibly complicated, you know, multi-layered scam? 
how incompetently would he do it? And we are shown exactly that. <laughs> yeah, and surprisingly enough, he sort of figures things out. I bumped yeah. really slow, but he figured things out. <laughs> I mean, the thing I will give this movie, it's the thing I didn't know going in. Because this is a movie where it looks like the story is like a noir. The look is a stoner movie, kinda. It also looks like a historical 70s thing. It's a comedy. It's hidden, but it's a comedy. It's a really funny movie. You're, you're laughing all the way through this thing, even when it gets into the dark places because of how wacky it is. Yes, but it, I wouldn't say it's so like a ha-ha funny. I think the trailers, if, if you see the trailers, now that you've seen the movie, you can probably look at the trailers. I try to avoid trailers mm -hmm. altogether, but but now, now that you've seen the movie, you can see it. They play it up like this is a really comedic romp, essentially. And yeah, and I, rem I remember this from back in 2014. I remember seeing those trailers. Yeah, and it's not quite that ha-ha funny, wacky adventure. No, because it has a lot of these sort of really heavy underlying themes, but at the same time, the the comedy is on point here. Very much in, I, I think, like it, almost in the same vein of The Dead Don't Die, where the comedy is never like in your face, haha, mm. but very much sort of the underlying tone of the movie is just so bizarre that you can't help but laugh at these bizarre situations that this character or these characters uh, are are put in. Yeah, I mean, it's got a kind of a Jarmouche, Coen Brothers, you know, very kind of interesting very much comedic. Coen Brothers, yes. Yeah. I think so, yeah. Which is and why I think to... uh, Boogie Nights is a good uh, sort of, if you're, if you're talking about Paul Thomas Anderson, Boogie Nights is a good analog in terms of the comedy. Yeah, I think this one takes it further than Boogie Nights, though, mainly because Boogie yes. Nights has a slightly more restrained style, even if its subject matter was almost crazier. Yeah, I think the director was also still young to the scene at the point at that time. He's much more mature and refined than his his craft at this point in his life. I mean, I think that's what's so funny about it is that a lot of this film doesn't actually feel very refined because it is shot in a very old school way. There's a lot of film grain. There's oh, yeah. a lot of like old school workmanship going on here that feels like it's a throwback. I mean, there's a lot of these mm -hmm. shots that, while they are actually beautifully framed, they look badly framed. We don't have a lot of sweeping panoramic nothing. No, no, it's shot very much of the time. It really mm -hmm. immerses you in the time period in that sense, which is which it does a great job of doing that. And one of the things I noticed on rewatching the movie uh, now for like a third or fourth time. Mm. is uh, just how much film green is on it. Oh, yeah, <laughs> like, no, I, it's, it's the, the first, first thing, thing I saw. Noticed. Yeah, it's the first thing you notice, is just the insane amount of film green. Yeah, and it's not, yeah. not only the amount of film green, but it like it the way they use color is so obvious. There's nothing very subtle about this movie in that regard. No. It's shot right. like a, like an old school seventies, you know, cop horror drama to something. It's like it's got a real texture to it of the time. Mm -hmm. And that's part of what makes it feel so of the time. Because yeah, for the first five, ten minutes of watching this movie, I was kind of just going like, What is this? What is happening? I I I'm I'm losing where the story starts. And that's gonna make it hard to follow. But then, you know, Josh Brolin showed up with an afro. <laughs> Trying to sell me real estate, and I'm like, okay, movie, I'm gonna give you a shot. And I released myself into the void 1970. <laughs> yes. And it yeah, worked. No. I mean, you really just had to kind of let it go. And then once you're there, you're good. You're fine. It is willing to work with you. Yeah. No, it's a, it does an amazing job. And another thing I want to mention, because we keep mentioning that this is like a stoner movie and there's a lot of hallucinations and whatever. Everything is incredibly grounded, though. Oh, yeah. There I mean, we don't no, go like, into you're in loathing in Las Vegas territory. No, no. There's there's nothing that, that actually... It, very little cues indicate a hallucination. There's almost, there's almost nothing that really indicates it very clearly. Everything feels yeah. and seems real. Yeah, and we're never watching any character's POV where something pops into frame or colors change or anything like that. It's just all in performance. All these characters are clearly coming, they're performing through a filter of something. And uh, 
I feel like I think like the only character that sort of is almost in his head is sort of liege, I think, to mm-hmm. a certain degree. Yeah. Saying earlier is like, yeah, you don't know if they've actually interacted with other people at some point. I mean, she probably is real or was real at some point, <laughs> which is kind of crazy. Yeah, I mean, I I like the fact that we begin with Brolin acting uh, at yep. least kind of normally, and then he just kind of goes into his own weird space. <laughs> so I like the fact that we have Selige, who is like a grounded character, but she keeps talking about astrology. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So stoner ESP. We're oh hearing. Oh my god! About... Yes, I love that <laughs> stoner yeah. ESP. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah, we're hearing about like. Yeah, in the month of the salacial moon, the 90 degree angle, something, something. It's like lots of this weird talk, but she seems very steady. Yeah. And and even at some point, like, she she talks to the character, or, like, that, that's when you sort of know that this is a voice in his head, is when mm. she goes, uh, remember, stoner ESP. <laughs> yeah, and he's remember. like, I'm going to go check the trunk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And he finds out that he's been pretty much set up at that point. Yeah, I mean, Brolin is the one I thought was going to be this, like the the steady character, but he, by the end of this, has gone completely off the rails. Yeah, uh, arguably, well, I mean, it's it's up to it's up for debate whether or not that really happened. But mm. sure, <laughs> sure. Yeah, but I mean, in terms of our perspective as you know, the audience, because we we have to see this through Phoenix's eyes. We're yeah. not given an option. No, we're not. I mean, that's sort of the nature of an unreliable narrator. Yep. And it is it is very interesting because they keep playing. At no point do they give us this visual sign. Yeah, this guy's nuts. We are only given mm-hmm. the ground facts, but the ground facts have people acting very weirdly. Yeah. <laughs> And I think I think that that final scene, you know, you bringing up the the final scene with Josh Brolin, mm. um, the way that I sort of understood it was more in the sense of so so throughout the whole movie, these two characters are complete opposites, and they constantly yes. butt heads. Uh, at a lot of points, uh, Brolin beats Phoenix <laughs> senselessly <laughs> because they are self so. Different worlds, essentially. Yeah. Uh, but I think I think, but but you know, as they're going through, they constantly go back to each other because I think that there is this uh, underlying sense of respect almost between the two for their craft uh, as sure detectives. Respect, or it's just straight up camaraderie because they're the only ones who are listening to the other one. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And. Uh, and it's it's even hinted at that they might have you know grown up together essentially because uh, they keep yeah. referencing how you know when they were younger uh, and they keep going a bit back and forth on that and the junior well, high and such yeah and I feel that that last scene where Brolin just goes nuts <laughs> and just <laughs> eats all the pot in the world oh uh, man <laughs> just uh, chews it of, up yeah and it, <laughs> literally and it's it's sort of a a sign or almost a metaphorical representation of him congratulating and accepting uh, Phoenix uh, or uh, Sp- Doc Sportello's uh, character mm-hmm. at that point for figuring everything out that that he's sort of like willing to go into his world for a second after kicking down his door. Yeah, no, I mean it is it is such a bizarre contrast because neither of them act quote unquote normally. But it is certainly a different way of handling the world. Because you've got, like, Doc, who is kind of nice to everybody. Yeah. Uh, and crazy, have... crazy nice, actually. Because he yeah. gives up, like, a lot of cash just to save this person. Uh, because yeah. he's like, uh, you know, no one should, uh, should uh, no father should grow up uh, not, not seeing their daughter, essentially, or something like that. Yeah, he's, like, a really nice guy. And then you have Brolin... Screaming at a Japanese chef for pancakes. Uh, more, more pancakes <laughs> in Japanese. More pancakes. Yeah, just, was it Parakako? Uh, like, what is this movie? Because it does keep, several, on yeah, several occasions. It just keeps shifting these like ideas of who's a good guy, who's a bad guy, and it's kind of it's just a really interesting journey. I think that's the thing I would say. This movie is almost like 
a road trip movie of a place. It is an LA movie, but of a it, it's almost like uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood in that way. It's kind of a great snapshot of time movie. Sure. Yeah. No. It, it is. It is sort of uh, in that in that vein, I guess. Because it's, it's, it's definitely a, 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 a screenshot of of that time period. Yeah, because it's kind of it's a little hard to knuckle down this movie's because it is funny, but not ha ha funny. It is a mystery, but the mystery isn't important. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And that was sort of the point that I was trying to put forth in the beginning, where it's very hard to pinpoint what this movie is or what it's trying to be because it's sort of merges all these different uh genres and and ideas together and it's and from what i've read at least it's very much a a faithful retelling of the book or as faithful as you can get in a movie Mm. but also leaves a lot of crazier things out so the book goes even more bizarre than the than this story apparently how (laughs) Uh, I don't know. Ask the ask the writer. <laughs> oh man, I might need to look this thing up. This sounds completely insane. If this is if this is the mild, what on earth is the book? Yeah, I mean, ever since I saw this movie, I've been interested in reading the book, but I've also been afraid because I don't want to taint my love of the movie. Because oftentimes, when you read when you read the book, it's usually very different and almost and almost always better than the movie or whatever other medium. Yeah, so I've kind of been true. afraid. <laughs> I've been afraid to 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 read it, but uh, but yeah, we should you should definitely check it out if you're interested in in the movie. Well, I mean, I do like old kind of noir books, so it's certainly something I could consider checking out. But I mean, I I was surprised by this movie. This was a movie I wasn't sure I was going to get on board with. You were a bit cautious in recommending recommending it to me. I remember because mm-hmm. I mean, you understand why. I hope. Because it's a very hard movie to to recommend in the sense that, especially when you say that you're a very story driven kind of uh, person, that you love mm. a plot to be coherent and to be uh, at least some comprehensible, yeah. And this movie sort of edges or it goes really like it's constantly on the edge of that line where. It's nonsensical, but at the same time, very redeeming in its characters and the way that they're portrayed, and and the and the art of filmmaking in this movie is very much uh, center uh, center screen. Yeah, no, I said I mean, kind of. It, it took a good five minutes of watching before I was kind of willing to. I, I think it took a little bit to tell me what headspace it needed. I think that's the easiest way to put it. So it's kind of like, I'm starting out, I'm like, okay, what am I getting into? And it doesn't tell you at the beginning. It just kind of starts. There's not a lot of indication as to what kind of movie experience you're walking into. And because of that, you're kind of just kind of waiting for the movie to tell you that so you know how to approach it. Yeah, no, no you're absolutely right. It's uh, You're thrust into this world, and you're sort of expected to to navigate it as well. If not better, yeah, than I mean, you got a good, solid cold doc. open before you even get it, and that that makes it kind mm-hmm. of a different experience than a lot of movies I've seen, especially these noir movies. They're usually trying to give the audience enough breadcrumbs, and and I think uh, that that's a lot of reason. I mean, I think that's the reason why a lot of noir movies has mm-hmm. that yep. uh, narration through them. This is sort of give information, put people in the headspace of the protagonist or or the character, essentially. While in this movie, the 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 same narration is e- equally, but even but differently bizarre from the main character. Yeah, but it's because equally you never bizarre. know exactly where it's taking you because it keeps changing out whose perspective it's talking from, who knows what, why it's telling you these things, and you're like, I. It is really just a question of like kind of giving up the ghost of understanding and just trying to go along for the ride. Or do you have anything else to discuss? Uh, no, I think we kind of covered all the main points. It's a little hard again to follow, but this thing here is I I need a PowerPoint presentation and a flowchart. <laughs> yeah, speaking yeah. of PowerPoint presentation and flowchart, I love the scene in the movie where he, uh, you, you I don't know if you've seen the meme, but of uh, it's from Always Sunny in Philadelphia. You have the guy with the all the paper and the the thread going through. Uh, like all the different mm-hmm. names and whatever, and he's like crazy talking. 
Yeah, and and this movie has a scene similar to that where it's just about the point where if you're trying to follow the plot, you keep asking yourself like, <laughs> wait, who was that now again? And the character just draws up this major uh, timeline of names on the <laughs> on the on like a board and just talks about how everyone is connected and not connected and just draws this like crazy crazy thing. And we, was, we cut onto a straight shot of Joaquin Phoenix without his shirt on, and I think I'm watching the Joker again. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> exactly, and, and it's like it's, you just look at that and you're like, "Oh, thanks, okay. movie. Good to know." <laughs> yeah, so, no, completely. You can see it on his face. We're all sitting there. What's happening? Character. What's happening? Ah, <laughs> oh, I like the yeah. score. By the way, the score is nice. It's got a really smooth, subtle oh. score, but it is again very much of the time. And it doesn't. I don't think it does the thing where it's like uh, very much. No, uh, no, no, it's no. not the Guardians of the Galaxy type score where it, it kind of almost takes over the movie. No, no. This is this is very subtle. This is this is the kind of score where it's only there to sort of put you in the mood and drag you through each and every scenario so when things are tense the music gets nope. a little tenser but not too much and then when things are calm and you're just trying to go with the flow things are very smooth yeah, it's, and it's it kind of just takes you in that headspace. and it also isn't distracting it all fits very nicely yeah mm. and it's not afraid to have scenes that don't have music or background noise uh most uh Prominently in the in the scene where hmm. uh, Catherine uh, Waterston uh, Shasta is oh, his yeah, ex when she silent. has that monologue, uh, the really yeah that's silent. And also in, in other scenes when he's talking to different characters, he's not afraid to sort of drown out everything and just focus on the characters. Same thing when he's uh, when he's just had to break out of yes. his handcuffs and shoots the guy. It's completely silent, and you just hear him fumbling. Did and I then he screams, uh, did no, I get I mean, you? This movie is very much, <laughs> it, it's also, a, yeah. it, it trusts its actors and it trusts its dialogue. Because it is very, very well yeah. written in terms of actually putting everything you need into how people speak and what they speak about rather than, there's not a lot of exposition that's very obvious. And it's the kind of movie that's easily, that you can easily get obsessed with and try searching everything you oh, can yeah, to find after you've done watching. Uh because it's just it's just so en engrossing, I would say. Not it might not be engaging to everyone, but it's definitely engrossing. It is very. It, I one thing I will call it is textured. It has a real feel to it. There is nothing very fake about this product. It's not very plasticky. It has a real lived-in quality. This mm, world, definitely. And uh, and yeah, and I think. If you, if you're a Paul Thomas Anderson fan, this is very much mm. outside of anything that he's made before. And, you know, when you compare it to yeah. movies like Magnolia, I, I mean, I I love a lot of his movies. Magnolia, yeah. I absolutely adore. The Master, uh, there will be there blood. Will be blood. Yeah. Oh my God, there will be blood. I mean, that's and, my movie uh, for him. That's my favorite movie he's made. It's it's got one of the best performances by one of the best actors ever. <laughs> so. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. it just it knocks it so far out of the park. This is a very, again, it's not prestigious. This is kind of down to earth, but yet wacky, which is kind of odd for a director like Anderson. Yeah, it's it's kind of the kind of movie that you would expect. Uh, and it's, it's like, it's hmm, how can I explain this? It's almost like an indie movie, but it's done on a budget. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's done on a big budget. <laughs> uh, speaking it's, of budget. I, from, yeah, go for it. Uh, I think it had, it says here it had an estimated of 20 million. And it only made back cumulatively uh, worldwide fourteen point seven, so it didn't make yeah. back its budget. It's not entirely surprising. It is that the kind of movie that usually it's the kind of movie that you're doing for accolade rather than money. Yeah, because it isn't prestigious. It isn't an Oscar thing. It's kind of an odd middle ground. Even though I think that the actors involved, a lot of whom deserved a lot of praise for their work here. Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, it's some of these performances. I mean, especially Brolin and Phoenix, but also some of these other performances, like you mentioned. Uh, you know, uh, the monologue with Catherine Waterston. You have mm. the 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 internal monologues that Joaquin has through Sordaliege, who's played by Joanna Newsom. 
you have a, you have a really good performance by Owen Wilson, which is not normal. <laughs> you know what I mean? And Same I must say, short. yeah, short does an amazing job. But I must say, one of my standouts, uh, and I just loved the way that she spoke her lines mainly, uh, mm. is Jade, uh, played by Hong Hong Shao, I believe is how you pronounce it. Sorry yeah, if I no, butchered she, that. Yeah, yeah, Hong Shao. No, she really knocked it out of the park. I was kind of surprised because that's I didn't recognize her from anything. I'm, I'm Me neither. At what she's been in. Yeah, I don't think she's been in a lot of uh, of things. Let's see. Uh, she's in downsizing, downsizing, which I never finished because I got I almost fell asleep. I think. <laughs> yeah, I haven't seen it yet. Uh, she's in Good Luck Charlie. She's in a lot of series. Yeah. She's not so much in yeah, movies. No. Inherent Vice. TV actor. Yeah, Inherent Vice. No, she knocked be... it out of the park. I was, I was kind of like, I, I, she must be a big name I just don't recognize. She does a really good job. Yeah, it was definitely the role that I was, um, what do you call it, like, most yeah. blown away by. Yeah, because, because of having absolutely no recognition for me personally. Like, I didn't know this person. Yep. All the other actors, most of which are incredibly well-known, Known. It's a huge list of these big name actors, and yeah. she came out of nowhere for me, at least. So I was I was really interested in seeing what else she's been in, and then you know apparently not not a lot. Apparently she's in the the Watchmen TV series, the new one by HBO. Still need to watch that. Yeah, I mean I haven't seen that either. Uh, I heard that it's yeah. supposed to be like a one season one off kind of limited series. So I'm uh, that's that's my oh. kind of show. So. <laughs> So I'm, I'm actually interested. That's that's a relief. Yeah, I I don't like TV shows that go on for too long. No, but um, I mean, my my personal MVP was my my personal MVP wasn't actually Joaquin Phoenix. It was Joaquin Phoenix scream when showing yes. the picture of a drug dealer. <laughs> yeah, because that little that I swear to God that moment was the most unexpected thing that happened in this film. Was just it it, it just came out of left field like a train. Just like wait, what happened? <laughs> I broke laughing. It's the, that, or perhaps the chocolate banana. The chocolate banana. <laughs> yeah, it, it's hard to pick, but I, I have to agree with you. Yeah, my 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 favorite scene in the movie is him screaming at that picture. <laughs> it's the best scene. <laughs> it's so great. <laughs> it's the kind of scene. It's, it's um, the kind of scene that I would make a gif of and just watch on repeat because it's just so good. Oh yeah, I mean, this is right up there with my favorite gif of all time, which is Wilfred Brimley on. Yeah, uh, hard target if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> hard target, man. That hit Wilfred Brimley riding away from that. Ex- one of my favorite things in the world. Old man Brimley. Oh. Oh. Bless his little heart. Oh yeah. All right. So final verdict. I think we're at the point where yeah, final verdict. I, you know what? I I I can't give it a ten, but I will absolutely give it a nine. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, I'm gonna have to agree with you. I I want to give this movie a ten, but it's just bizarre enough to where it can't really be considered sort of a an essential or a pinnacle of its genre because it's just no. too quirky for that. But definitely a nine with a, a huge recommendation for people who are into this sort of thing. Now that you've heard us talk about it, and hopefully you you sort of saw it beforehand, but because we've spoiled a lot. But but uh oh yeah, so <laughs> but, but uh but yeah, uh, uh, definitely if you're into this sort of movies, do yourself a favor, watch it. It's it's an incredible uh it's an incredible journey, I would say. Yep. No, I mean, I, I completely agree. It's one of those things where if you can get on the wavelength and you can kind of ride that movie, it'll take you places. Mm. But you have to kind of be willing to jump on ship. It is a little bit like The Dead Won't Die like mm-hmm. that. Yeah, definitely. And the chemistry between Brolin and Phoenix was amazing. Oh, if nothing man. else. That banana. The banana. <laughs> and Phoenix's is a reaction to the banana. <laughs> Oh god, that look! I I I, I felt for him because I was thinking the exact same. <laughs> Roland, are you all oh right, buddy? My god, yeah, oh, it's it's an amazing movie. But yeah, all right, okay. So uh, next week, anything uh, planned for next week, or we're just gonna take it as I think we're gonna just be winging it. We're we're in these interests. 
see if next week is remote or not. We 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 can't we are but caught in these currents of oddness. We are it's almost as quirky as the movie we just saw. I mean, it's really got a we got an odd feeling going on these days. Yeah, no, <laughs> to put it lightly, we've got an odd feeling. <laughs> yep. An odd feeling going on those days. But if you are enjoying the show, we are very thankful for you listening. Yes. And uh, you can catch us on, uh, we are, um, every Friday, we are on Stitcher, Spotify, iTunes, and YouTube. Yeah, and SoundCloud. And SoundCloud, yeah. You I, can, I always miss yeah. one. <laughs> and you can get in touch with us uh, on uh, site on screen at gmail.com if you have any questions or queries or comments or feedback. Uh, very much. Suggestions are always welcome. If you want to support the show, we are on site on screen at patreon.com. Or sorry, no, site on screen. Patreon.com slash site on screen. That's how you Correct. say it. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, please uh, share. Uh, more importantly, I think, is uh, just spread the word. If you like what you're, what you're hearing, not seeing, but if you like what you're hearing, I almost said seeing again. Mm. I made that mistake before. <laughs> <laughs> it's a common mistake that I make. Well, <laughs> Well our, well, our site is on screen, let's be clear. Yeah. But uh, please do recommend us to a friend. Yeah. You know, spread the good news. Yeah. Tell people about the show. Yeah, and, uh, and thank you so much, again, for listening. Yeah, we will catch you on the other psychedelic side.